Um, so, well, as as most of you know already, this is Ted Brecken. Uh, he he's a one of our faculty in the Energy Systems uh, group, and he's been here since 2005. He got his BS, MS, and PhD at the University of Minnesota. He just did not want to leave that state, but then he traversed, yeah, over here to the West Coast. I, I think this is you know this is a great place, uh, uh, you know compared to our, our upper neighbors and lower neighbors. Uh, if you come from Minnesota, it's probably a, a nice, it feels like home. Um, he, uh, he did some interesting uh, international stints. Uh, I, I didn't actually realize he had spent a year in South Korea doing motor design. And uh, then he, he was in Norway doing, uh, studying wind turbines, uh, I guess, right around the end of his PhD. So picked up a lot of international knowledge um, and, and now he co-directs the Wallace Energy Systems and Renewable uh, Resources facility here, which is a really cool facility if you haven't seen it. They've got a giant machine that will simulate uh, a wave, uh, waves that, that shakes a, a wave generator. Um, he's done a lot of work in renewables such as waves, wind, and solar and combining all of those together, which is probably one of the hardest problems that we're, we're facing um, these days, uh, unless we get better batteries. Um, and on top of that, he has to worry about earthquakes and things like that messing up the power grid. And, and I think that's gonna be the focus of today. Um, so I don't know how he sleeps at night, but he's gonna, he's gonna tell, us, uh, tell us about his work now. So take it away, Ted. Yeah, thank you, Alan. I'm just going to leave PowerPoint actually in the slide view here so that I can keep the uh, Zoom windows up. But yeah, so today we'll talk about earthquakes. As Alan said, I kind of wear two research hats, one on the marine energy side and the other on, um, on earthquakes. We have projects in both areas. Um, yeah, so let's get right into it. So Alan, do I have till 1130? Is that right? You, you can, uh, we've been lenient, um, but 1130 is fine, but you could go further than that if you want. Too. Okay, well, we're so shooting for about that. So, okay, sounds good. I didn't know how hard the deadline was. So, let's talk about earthquakes. So, um, I'm just going to show just a little bit of background geology uh, so you can kind of understand our situation and we can talk a little bit about how or why we should be sleeping at night or if we shouldn't or whatever. Uh, this is the uh, image there is the Pacific Ring of Fire. And so, the, uh, the Pacific Coast or the Pacific Ocean plates kind of bubble up in the center of the ocean and then shift off to the side and then subduct under the land masses, uh, which would be on the west coast of the United States and on the east coast of Japan and uh, China and Russia. Uh, also New Zealand, another earthquake hotspot. Uh, Chile, uh, another big earthquake hotspot. Yeah. So if we look at our particular place in this ring of fire, uh, this is kind of a 3D image showing a little bit what's happening underneath, but we can see here you have Washington State and then Oregon. Um, and about 100 miles off the coast is the Cascadia subduction zone. And that's where uh, the Pacific plate pushes on the Juan de Fuca plate and the Juan de Fuca plate slides underneath uh, the shelf, um, the, the North American plate. And where that slides underneath uh, generates uh, friction and volcanic activity. But you can see that little kind of reddish mark there is where it is stuck. So that Juan de Fuca plate is pushing on the North America plate, but it's locked at that point. But it won't stay locked forever. At some point, that point of friction will slip. And just like a spring, it's loaded up a whole bunch of energy. And when it slips, it will release all that energy. And it will be a very, very large earthquake. Um, estimated to be uh, even greater than magnitude nine, which is very large, very, very large earthquake. It'll actually be, it'll actually be near the, if the Cascadia subduction zone fault slips as badly as they think it might, when it does go, uh, will actually be about the largest that um, earthquakes can be generated um, on the crustal plates. So uh, it'll be a big deal. How often does this happen is the next question that we should probably ask. And what we see here is a timeline that goes back about 10,000 years. You can see 2000 AD is on the right and going to uh, 8,000 BC on the left. 
And the uh, smaller red tick marks on the timeline there are earthquakes that are <laughs> only magnitude eight, which is still huge, right? And then the bigger tick marks is where you had earthquakes that were magnitude nine. And so we can see some kind of estimate of, you know, we can do a statistical analysis of that um, and uh, kind of look at what the frequency of occurrence there is. Um, and you, you'll see it's something in the 300 years-ish time frame is about how frequently we're visited by an earthquake. And, you know, there's some periods of time where it went a little longer than that. If you look at some somewhere in there, uh, particularly if you look between about 5,000 and 4,000 BC, um, you know, there was maybe three earthquakes that struck uh, in about a thousand years, right? So you had about 300 years, but then you see other periods where it was a little denser, where it might be only ever 100 years or 200 years. Right? So there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. We do know it will go, but, you know, it's not, it's not like clockwork. There's some, uh, there's some uncertainty about when that eventually slips. But if you look at where we are now, you can see that, you know, we are sort of getting toward the upper edge of how long those windows can be right, before we're visited by another earthquake. So that's our, that's our timeline. I'm going to talk a little bit about Japan. I have a couple slides on that because we're very interested in what happens to Japan. Japan gets visited by their respective fault a little more frequently than we do. Um, and Japan is a geological mirror to us. If I go back a couple slides to the uh, Ring of Fire, um, you see that what they, they have a mirrored situation to us. They have their Pacific plate diving under their continental plate. They have a subduction zone fault there as well, just like we do. And so what happens to Japan, we're very interested because that gives us an insight into what might happen to us. So let's talk a little bit about the electrical side of things. So what happens if, uh, if we have this earthquake? Um, I could easily do a multi-hour presentation talking about the impact on all the various lifelines. However, this presentation is focused specifically on the electrical system. So I'm going to talk more specifically about the electrical side. So here's a happy substation. This is on the Bonneville Power Administration System. <clears throat> um, substations, uh, those of you who don't know electrical substations, those are those uh, collections of ominously buzzing equipment behind a barbed wire fence at various parts around town. Uh, this substation is a very large one. This is a transmission level substation. Substations do a couple things. Uh, one thing that they do is that they uh, step the transmission line voltage down so that we can send it out to our neighborhoods and communities. And it also provides various protection services. So for example, if there's a fault on the line somewhere, if a tree falls on a line and causes a fault, uh, there is uh, special devices in here that will disconnect that line right? and to cut off parts of the grid to save the rest of the grid. So various metering and protection functionality along with the transformer functions are all provided in these substations. But if you look at them, you can see, well, this is, you know, there's like a lot of tall, thin structures. You know, just glancing at this, we can ask the question, does this look like something that is very seismically robust? Does this look like something that if you shook it violently uh, would do well? <laughs> And of course, I'm leading the question, you know, and the answer is no, no, they don't do very well. Um, this is not the same substation. Let me emphasize that. This is a uh, substation in China. But it gives you an, uh, an idea anyway of the kinds of destruction. Here we have, you know, a complete loss, complete loss of the substation. And in the upper right also is shown the control house for the substation. And that's a structure that would house various um, communications, uh, other metering equipment, you know, control systems, other things for operating the equipment in the substation yard. Uh, and so that building was completely lost as well. So this substation is completely gone. So let's talk a little bit about what it kind of focused on in that picture was a dramatic picture of the shaking damage. But earthquakes actually destroy in a couple different ways. Now shaking is the one that a lot of people think of, and that's why I have it as the first bullet first bullet point, but there are other methods, other means by which an earthquake can destroy things. Uh, there's something called soil liquefaction. Uh, soil liquefaction is which case the ground loses its structural integrity underneath whatever the object is. So the thing might not be shaken apart, but the ground may fail underneath it. Uh, landslides, that's where land moves underneath something, right? And that also may cause falling debris. You may have a landslide that comes down and sweeps away a road, for example, even if the road wasn't damaged by the shaking. 
happen. And then last, the big one for us, for the coastal area as well, are tsunamis, right? And obviously a tsunami, um, as we will see in the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, uh, causes, a lot of, uh, causes a lot of destruction as well. So first I'll talk a little bit about the shaking. Here's an image of some circuit breakers. These are what's called live tank circuit breakers. And again, you see that these structures are characterized. Uh, they're, they're tall, uh, they're top weighted, uh, and uh, they're composed of brittle components. Kind of the dark brownish maroon color that you see right here is ceramic, ceramic insulators. Um, and so, you know, these don't handle shaking very well at all. In fact, this phase of circuit breakers completely failed. Liquefaction, right? I mentioned this, the failure of soil. So we see on the left, a rather dramatic example where the soil liquefied and the things that were on top of the soil just sunk completely into it. Now, this phenomenon happens because when you have it, saturated soils are particularly vulnerable. Uh, when you have a saturated soil, you have water in between the grains of sand. And that can seem like that's fine under normal conditions, but under the repeated stress of shaking, uh, there's a pressure buildup of the water in the saturated water held in suspension in the soil. And that extra pressure buildup can cause the grains of the soil to separate far enough apart that it doesn't act like a soil anymore. It acts like a liquid. And then just something will just sink down into it. On the right is an image from um, a New Zealand earthquake in an example where the footing of a uh, transmission tower has just sunk into the ground. Right? So it does, it's not on solid footing anymore. Landslides, right? that's where we have um, the motion of the ground. The ground loses its integrity and you know, runs downhill, basically. Uh, we have an image on the left of a substation that wasn't damaged directly by shaking, but was damaged by a landslide. So debris just fell into this substation and uh, completely damaged this equipment. On the right is a map from the Oregon Resilience Plan. It's an open, freely available document if you're interested in this topic that goes through all the various things that can happen to our area. Um, it's about, uh, well, it's almost nine years old now, but I'm um, still highly recommended reading if you're interested in this area. Um, but anyway, there's a map of uh, where we're likely to have ground movement greater than one foot in the case of a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And you can see that, I mean, there's just landslides everywhere. There's landslides everywhere. There's so much ground failure that's going to happen along the coast and it's gonna destroy structures, it's gonna destroy roads, it's gonna destroy transmission towers. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but it's something that the landslide threat is something that is, we are very, very vulnerable to in this area because we have, you know, hilly land and, you know, hilly land is, is basically in many cases just barely stable and uh, it only takes a little bit of a push for it to, to fail. Pretty dramatic example. I just put this picture in here because it's like, wow, that's a real picture, but a pretty dramatic example of a, of a boulder that was shaken loose. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm laughing, but I hope no one, was, no one was hurt or was in that part of the house there. But anyway, pretty dramatic, uh, pretty dramatic example of you know where debris can fall and can damage things. Um, I believe this is in Europe somewhere. Um, this is not near here. But. And talk a little bit about what happened in Tohoku in 2011. So this is Japan 2011. The red X on the right there shows the, uh, the epicenter of the fault slippage. And um, you can see a measure of seismic intensity shown there as well. And so we're very interested in what happens here because that's what we may face. This is 2011. It was a nine, magnitude nine earthquake, uh, which is pretty similar to what we may face. Uh, it was Japan's most powerful uh, earthquake on record. A full six minutes of shaking um, and uh, peak ground accelerations up to three. So to put that in context, once you're looking at peak ground accelerations that are somewhere in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range, a tenth of this, you start to see pretty significant failure of things. So you're looking at 10 times that and occurring for six minutes. Um, there's lots of video footage um, you can certainly find online and kind of get a sense for, for what that experience is like. Uh, about 15,000 people dead and um, the tsunami was the one that really hammered it though. It really, really got hit by the tsunami. Uh, Japan is the most seismically uh, prepared country on earth. And this stresses a point I want to mention that we face in the Pacific Northwest is that we are not regularly tested. So we don't, we have a guess as to where our problems are, but we don't know for sure. Right? It's the famous Donald Rumsfeld thing about your unknown unknowns. 
right? And so if your system is uh, frequently tested, you find out where your problems are, right? And you get a chance to upgrade those systems, but we don't know. Japan knows, right? Japan's tested very frequently, so they have a pretty robust system and they pretty much know where their weak points are. They know how long it will take to repair things, but we are not regularly tested. But if we look at anyway, the, the, um, the tsunami in Japan, of course, there's a lot of footage of that. We've all seen footage of it. Um, here's a you know, pretty dramatic image of the, uh, the seawater breaching um, the bay tsunami wall. And uh, you know, just pretty, pretty dramatic images of destruction. So obviously any communities, uh, of course, including the electrical system are, are heavily damaged um, under, these, under these scenarios. Um, there's a lot of bullet points here. We won't go through all of it, but just to summarize the electrical impacts um, of the, of the uh, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami um, had an extremely large loss of load. So meaning that the electrical system in the moments after the earthquake disconnected from a great deal of the load. So a very large, very large percentage of people um, were without power immediately after. Um, but I'll talk about, the, we'll show an image of that in a second. Um, it also lost a good amount of generation. Um, interestingly, none of the 2.3 gigawatts of wind turbines failed. Turbines aren't really affected by ground shaking. That doesn't really bother them. Um, but uh, liquefaction or landslides could be issues. Nonetheless, Japan didn't really see any problems with that. Um, the tsunami did most of the damage um, directly to the electrical system. Um, also, uh, of course, Fukushima uh, was the, uh, the uh, nuke plant on the coast. Uh, the inundation of the seawater caused backup generators to fail, which meant that they couldn't run the pumps to run the cooling water through the reactors, which resulted in the meltdown of several of the reactors. Um, this is, uh, it will require decades of management. So the site is pretty, is cordoned off and they're just kind of waiting for the whole mess to cool down. It will take a couple decades. Um, and then, you know, we'll send in some robots to try and clean stuff up. But for the moment, all you can do is just quarantine it away um, and just, uh, you know, come back to it later. Uh, interestingly, they tried some funky things just from an engineering point of view. It's quite interesting. One of the things they tried to do is they actually dug a bunch of boreholes around the, the campus of Fukushima and put heat exchangers or cooling elements down in those boreholes and basically ran and basically they turned the entire perimeter into a massive refrigerator. Um, because they, what they were trying to do is they were trying to freeze an ice wall, a subterranean ice wall around the uh, power plant campus to keep, uh, to contain any contamination. Um, that likely failed, they think it didn't work, but it's a super interesting idea though. I just thought from an engineering point of view, that was pretty, that was a pretty crazy thing to try. Now the recovery of the system. So that sounds very destructive and it was, but what's interesting is how quick the recovery is, right? Remember we're talking about a, a place that is regularly tested. And so we see at the moment of the earthquake, we had a loss of about uh, almost 4.5 million homes. Um, and, but the recovery is, you know, even within 10 days, they had recovered more than 90% of that. So considering the, the magnitude of that devastation, that's a pretty quick recovery. And this is also sort of similar to what we see to other areas like Chile. Um, you're looking at recovery times that are measured in the days and in a really bad case, maybe it goes out to weeks, right? But we're looking at like days or weeks. So keep that in mind, something like days or weeks for a country that, that knows what it's doing, a country that's well prepared. It's like, I've been in this situation before I know what to do. What are we looking at in the Pacific Northwest? Well, we don't know for sure because we haven't been tested yet but we can estimate our test. <laughs> and our estimates are, we're looking at something like on the coast where the devastation will be pretty, com will be pretty complete. Um, you know, maybe upward estimates of six months um, before we have electricity. And that's really devastating. That's, that's, a, that's a tremendously long time to be without services. Um, it's generally estimated, so for the folks that study economic impacts of disaster, it's generally estimated that you're looking at around, um, if businesses can usually survive a few weeks without a uh, service. So if a business, you know, doesn't have a building that's functional or doesn't have electricity or heating or communications or anything like that, generally you can survive for a few weeks. And at that point, then the, after that, the owners are generally going to pack up and leave that, that company, you know, they, they'll, they'll abandon that business or they'll abandon their homes. And so really what you want is you want to encourage people to shelter in place and you want to be able to have them ride out 
something that doesn't last more than a few weeks at the most. Um, but we're looking at, at, at windows that are much greater than that. So what that means is that there would likely be permanent economic depression to the areas that were affected. Even after, even years later, when much of it is rebuilt, you would have permanently changed the economic trajectory of those affected communities and they wouldn't rebuild to the same extent. So that's why it's extremely important to, to, you know, so to be prepared and, and to get these systems back up and running as quickly as possible. I'm gonna quickly fly through sort of some of the things that were, are most vulnerable on the grid. Uh, transformers are a big one. So transformers are, it's no exaggeration to say that you owe everything that's good in your life to transformers. Um, they are absolutely one of the most significant things that exist on planet Earth. Uh, what they do is they, they enable AC transmission, which basically enables the grid. And that's why we have electricity. What transformers do is they take the very, very high voltage that we use for transmission that allows us to efficiently send electricity long distances, step that down to a voltage that's safe to distribute to homes and neighborhoods, things like that. However, they're pretty particular specialized pieces of equipment and we don't have a big store of them. They're not something that we buy off the shelf. They're generally custom built for each of their applications. And there's something like a one to two year lead time on them. So that means that if you lose a bunch of transformers, you're not gonna be re to replace the majority of those transformers for like a year or maybe two years. So it's a very, very vulnerable and necessary piece of equipment, very, very high risk, right? So this is one of the components of the electrical system that we're most interested in protecting and having some, some backup resources for. Um, something called bushings, circuit breakers and bushings. Bushings refer to those tall, thin structures that you see. So in this image right here, here's a circuit breaker. This tall, thin right here thing right here is a bushing. The bushing's job is to take the very high voltage at this conductor and run it down through an insulator and into this piece of equipment. The insulator is often ceramic, particularly on older systems. And so we have a tall, thin structure made of brittle, brittle material. Obviously, it's something that's probably going to fail. So that's something that we look at. The generators themselves are pretty robust to shaking. The image here is the generator hall of a hydro plant or a dam inside a dam. If you ever wondered what's inside the big dams, it looks something like this. Uh, this is the very top of an electrical generator underneath extending tens of meters below the surface that you see right here is the rest of the generator and the hydro turbine. And on the penstock that brings the water through the hydro turbine is all underground here. Um, these are actually pretty robust to shaking. They're, they're not going to be so often directly damaged by the shaking, but they can have, they can shift on their pads so the foundations can get shifted and can cause misalignment problems. Uh, also, any auxiliary systems that support these can be damaged as well. However, for the most part, we expect generators to do pretty well in a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. It's not to say there won't be some outages, but they're not, they're most likely not the most vulnerable component of the system. The transmission lines, most of, our, most of our generation is east of the load. This image right here from the, from the Northwest Power and Conservation Council, uh, the blue dots show, the blue and gray dots uh, show various wind and hydro generation around the area. Uh, and you'll notice that a lot of our generation is east of where the people are. So that means our transmission lines come over the Cascade Range. That means that a lot of those transmission towers are going to be exposed to landslide prone areas. Here's a um, picture from a transmission town failure in Taiwan. Um, and you'll see that the tower has, um, has shifted on its foundation. The towers themselves, so the interesting thing about transmission towers is that they are actually very, very robust to shaking. Towers are really strong because they're made to handle tremendous wind and ice loads. So they're actually really robust structures. The shaking is not the problem for them. What's the problem is the ground failing underneath them. And so when you talk about liquefaction or landslides, that's, that's the bigger threat to towers. Also river crossings. We have a fair number of river crossings and that's an issue as well. So what are the things that we can do to help? Uh, some things are seismic hardening. So there's an IEEE standard for this, IEEE standard 693 that talks about how to upgrade equipment to make it more robust to earthquakes. And we actually are doing a lot of that in the Pacific Northwest. There's actually been tremendous progress in the last 10 years in retrofitting equipment by I think absolutely no one would say that we're ready, but it's no, undoubtedly a lot of progress has been made. Some very easy things that we can do, like better anchoring of equipment, that is equipment that's bolted to the ground. A lot of times equipment is just resting, it's just rest, just gravity just holds it in place, particularly if it's heavy equipment. 
But if you bolt it down, um, then it you can't slide off its pad during the shaking and things like that. So there's some very easy things you can do. Farther out, looking at things like microgrids, um, distributed generation. So having generation that's more scattered around, it's not so you don't have all your eggs in one basket could possibly help if it's coupled with microgrids. Also potentially energy storage so that if you have loss of generation in some place, um, something, uh, you know, energy storage would be available. Um, I just want to talk briefly about a project that we have on this. So there's a earthquake resilience of the Western power grid is a project I'm the lead PI on, but also have my colleague and good friend, Dr. Cortia Sanchez. And from civil engineering, we have Dr. Mike Olson and Dr. Armin Stewardlin. And what we're doing is we're taking a model of the entire Western grid of the United States. So there's three main grids in the US, the East Coast grid, the West Coast grid and Texas. And as we've learned recently, right? A lot of people didn't know that before, but <laughs> now you know, <laughs> Texas is its own grid. Um, but we're looking at the West Coast grid here. And what we're doing is we're retrofitting what's called a, uh, a bus branch model to be a node breaker model. Um, and that's a little bit of a technical detail, but it just allows us to, allows us to model the equipment on the system at a, at a higher resolution than we would normally be able to. So then we hit this with a virtual earthquake and we see what the impact is. Here's a map of PGAs, expected PGAs for a um, uh, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. You can see it's very, very strong here. These parts of the system are not really affected at all, uh, but these are strongly affected. And then how do we model that? How, like, how do we do an analysis? And what we do is we couple that with something called a fragility function. And a fragility function shows the likelihood of failure given a certain amount of acceleration. So for example, if we have a substation that's experiencing 0.4 peak ground acceleration, there's a little greater than 50% chance that it will be completely destroyed. Okay. So this enables us to do a probabilistic like Monte Carlo style analysis of the possible destruction. And we're just starting to do this. We're just getting into it right now, but it allows us to, to um, uh, create these probabilistic distributions of what might happen. So for example, here's just one example of estimated how much load that we're gonna lose. So we did, we did this particular test 5,000 times across all those substations, given the PGA that's expected at all of them, and found that we would lose something like 12% of our total WEC load. So WEC is the Western grid. So of that entire system, maybe 12% of it would be lost, uh, but nearly 100% of it, you know, specifically in this region. Right. So don't quote me on these results yet, but I'm just kind of showing, kind of getting at sort of what this analysis looks like, and it's probabilistic in nature. A couple other things to move really, really quickly through. I want to be mindful of the time. I want to talk about Texas a little bit. Um, so I mentioned that. So, so shown right here again is a fragility function for a, um, for a substation. But the substations are not a single piece of equipment. They are, in fact, many, many, many pieces of equipment. So we wanted to see if treating the substation as a single piece of equipment is valid if we model all the individual pieces of equipment and determine the failure probabilities from the ground up. This bottom up verification. And we looked at four different substation configurations. So substations come in different flavors. They're set up in different ways, depending on what they need to do. And from the bottom up, then we tried to verify. So for example, what's shown here, if you look at the dark blue one, the dashed line is the probability of being uh, completely damaged given a certain pre-ground acceleration. Um, if we treat the substation as a single asset and the dark line is the probability of being completely damaged when we modeled all the individual components in the substation. And you can see for uh, the complete devastation state, uh, we modeled that we actually was able to model that really well. So that's a nice verification of this modeling it as a single asset. In other ones, it wasn't quite so great, um, but it, um, anyway, it gives us some, uh, some idea whether treating what's in fact a complex amalgamation of assets as a single asset has any validity at all. Uh, substation, substation classification, we also did, uh, we had some REUs work on this. So actually this was, so Alan, our, our esteemed host today was very helpful on this because he helped spearhead a process by which we could get REUs, research undergraduates. And we had research undergraduates look at taking satellite imagery of the electrical system. So any of this is, you can check this out on Google Earth or whatever, this is a particular substation. This is what the substation actually looks like. 
Uh, this is a line diagram of the substation. It's got three ring buses, what we call a ring bus, and you can see them here. And so we had students look and see if they could learn to identify from the satellite imagery what type of configuration it was. That's the human training. And then taking that a step further, we had them see if they could do machine learning techniques uh, to take satellite imagery and reconstruct the line diagram from that. That was a pretty interesting project. We just kind of got started on the machine learning part of it at the very end of their tenure over the summer, but some of the initial results were promising. And then lastly, I just want to talk about Texas really briefly. So uh, Texas, of course, we know. Um, so big thanks to my to my buddy and colleague, Alberto uh, Lamidrad from Lehigh, and giving me some information on this. Um, he studies this kind of stuff as well. Um, but, you know, picture on the right, we see um, percentage of customers without power. You notice there's a good chunk in Oregon there as well. And I've actually been in contact with some of those students that have had delays in being able to do their work because of loss of internet access and things like that. But obviously the big picture here is Texas with um, a very large percentage of people without power. If we look at what happened, so this is a, from a very nice article in the New York Times. Um, if we look at actually what happened, you see the dotted line in the middle there when the, when the winter storm starts. And uh, you can see that there's a loss. So the top line is natural gas, and there's a pretty significant loss of natural gas production, uh, particularly about half a day after the start of the storm. Um, then there was also a reduction in the coal generation. There was some reduction in the wind generation, that's the blue line, some reduction in the nuke generation as well, that's the purple line. And uh, solar actually held steady or did even a little better afterwards. Um, the, so the, everything took a hit. None of this stuff was designed for that. So one, my kind of takeaway from the Texas situation is that people seem very eager to rush to blame something, right? There's very, you have people on the left sort of rushing to blame deregulation, uh, which is a, you know, a complex, uh, complex situation, a little tough to kind of draw, a, to connect the dots out directly. Um, people on the right saying very silly things about wind turbines, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but, you know, for I think for the folks that are in power systems, it's like, you know, if you'll pardon the vulgarity, it's kind of like, you know, shit happens. You, you design a system for a particular condition. The Texas system is designed to handle high air conditioning loads. It is not designed for intense winter storms. It's just not designed for it. So I think anyone that works in, um, works in power or grid systems would be like, yeah, of course, right? Of course, if you have a system that's not designed for massive freezing temperatures and ice loads, of course, it's going to get utterly hammered by that. And that's what happened. Yeah. Um, just some nice uh, quotes from that particular article. Um, the loss of natural gas was the biggest part. Lost about five times more natural gas than there was anything else, particularly wind. Um, wind turbines work completely fine in winter conditions if they're built for that. And these turbines weren't built for that. And natural gas works completely fine in winter conditions if you're built for that. And this system wasn't built for that. So a lot of their natural gas wellheads froze, which meant that they weren't able to deliver natural gas. Right? Also had some, several other like coal and nuke plants had problems as well with failures of their auxiliary systems. So really everything across the board was affected because none of it is designed to operate this way. Texas grid is designed to operate uh, with heavy air conditioning loads, not, not in winter storms. So that's my, that's my three minute takeaway from the Texas story. But uh, be respectful of time, I'll wrap up there. And if there's time for questions, I'm happy to do it. Whatever you wanna do, Alan. Yeah, there's, uh, there's plenty of time for questions. Um, so I think we might've had a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Charlie, do you just want to go ahead and ask it? If you're you're still on, I, I'm... yeah, that would require me to unmute. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, Ted, you were going through uh, the different kinds of uh, uh, equipment, and you'd mentioned seismic upgrades or seismic hardening. Uh, are there um, solutions for all the different types of equipment in terms of seismic hardening? Like bushings look like super uh, vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. First, great question, Charlie. It's nice to talk to you again. It's been been a long time. Um, the, I'd be happy to talk about that. So the so a couple of things specifically that you can do. There's a couple of big ones that come to mind that are sort of the low hanging fruit. Um, one of them. So this is what we call a live. I'll show. This is what we call a live tank circuit breaker. This picture right here is what's called a live tank circuit breaker. And live tank circuit breakers tend to be very. They're very top heavy, and it's kind of a. It's an older. It's an older um, circuit breaker style. Um, in many cases, they are being replaced by what's called the dead tank circuit breaker. And a dead tank circuit breaker looks like 
this, where now the structure is mostly on the ground. So these have much better robustness properties. And so some things are kind of happening organically, like over time, kind of gradually moving from uh, live tank circuit breakers to dead tank, dead tank circuit breakers is one example of that. The bushings, what are being done in some cases there as well, is the newer bushings are a composite material. And I'm sorry, I don't have expertise on the chemistry of it, but I know it's a composite material that's not ceramic that has a better robustness properties. And so that's kind of something that's just sort of organically happening over time as well, is that as older equipment is being replaced, it's being replaced, ceramics are being replaced with composites. Um, and that's one thing that, that helps. Um, another thing that's being done, I don't know if I have a great picture of it here, but another thing that's being done, so you can kind of see, you see uh, where my cursor is pointing at here, there's this flexible connection from the rigid bus, from the rigid bus, there's a flexible connection to the top of the bushing. One thing that's being done in many substations is that these are being retrofitted, these flexible connections are being retrofitted with more, more flex in them. So that in the case of shaking, because here we have one rigid structure and here you have another bridge, rigid structure. And if they're both being shaken, they're both gonna oscillate at their own respective harmonic modes. And it can be, and it's often the case that those harmonic modes are such that, you know, they pull on each other in a detrimental way. And so if you have more flex, you can have the, each item more, more harmonically isolated from each other. So that's another thing that's being done. And uh, the other thing, the other really big one, the big low hanging fruit is uh, mounting transformers to their pads. So a lot, of, a lot of transformers are actually not firmly mounted to the ground. Their gravity mostly holds them in place. And so a very, very simple thing that you can do is you can go through and retroactively um, firmly connect the uh, transformer to the ground. Um, and that, uh, what that does is that actually um, makes it more, this seems kind of counterintuitive, but it makes it more seismically robust because without that, what happens is the ground shakes underneath the transformer and the transformer skitters and shakes off of its pad. And I have some pictures of that, but then you get a transformer that, sh that goes off of its pad and then it like tips on its side or falls over or something like that. So um, they actually bolt that down is better. And then the last thing I'll say is that there is, there are doing some funky actually vibration isolation mounts, which is an expensive retrofit. It's something that they're just playing around with but it's basically you have like a floating, you, you, it's kind of like a, kind of like half a ball bearing. And um, the, the transformer sits on several of those. And so that during shaking, it, it can kind of raw, it can kind of float and ride that out. So those are some of the, uh, the uh, immediate things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we also had a uh, question. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just read this one. So, so do your estimates for three to six months before power restoration on the coast include any assumptions for alternate power paths, for example, large scale diesel generation, you know, based on ships? Um, no, no, none of that is based on that. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's an idea that's, um, you know, could, could be in play. It's something I've heard people talk about. Um, to the best that I'm aware of, there's not a significant concerted effort to make that happen. So it's just kind of an idea at this point, and those estimates do not include that. And uh, I'll just follow up with that, and then John, you can, can ask your question. So yeah, I, I was curious how, how that, so you were talking about the transformers, and there was a question about those as well, um, taking one to two years to manufacture. And uh, that, that seemed to be at odds with the three to six months or one to three months uh, time frame. So, so was that assuming that the transformers could be repaired or that we have enough on reserve or, or what was the? There are some, there are some in reserve. It's not, a, it's not a large stock though. So this kind of answers another question that's in there. But so um, transformers, so the utilities generally, and this has kind of speaks to the Texas case. So in Texas case, it's actually in the Texas constitution that the grid has to be separate from the, the east and west grids. Um, they, they literally have their own AC synchronization. So the grid frequency in Texas is different than the grid frequency that we have or the grid frequency that the east coast has. It really is its own grid. Um, and so kind of one of the disadvantages of that, you know, kind of ready to secede at a moment's notice uh, mindset is that you're not in a great position to share with your neighbors uh, when there's a problem. 
Um, in I, to the credit of a lot of the utilities in the Pacific Northwest, um, there's fairly good cooperation. There's actually something called the incident command system structure. Uh, there's uh, actually an emergency uh, uh, a method of organizing in the case in this in the case of an emergency that allows utilities to actually share resources amongst themselves. You know, maybe in a way that's hopefully much better than if they were isolated. So part of that is sharing equipment and part of that is sharing of some transformers. So there may be, in some cases, there may be some situations where transformers are able to be shared between the utilities and be able to brought from one area to another. However, there's not a big store of them at all. They're a fairly limited piece of equipment. And the other thing is that even if somebody had a transformer, you might not, actually you very likely will not be able to get it where it needs to go because all of the roads will have failed. Right, particularly on you know in the I five corridor, there's like there's like 150 landslides that are going to happen on the I five corridor or something like that. There's some stupid number of landslides that are going to happen. They're going to take out I five and all this other stuff. And so even if you have the equipment, you might not be able to get it where it needs to go. So those those are the the, the really big issues. But there is a limited store of transformers, but there there are not much of them. They're very specialty pieces of equipment. You know, the other big threat to transformers, if you're interested in that doomsday scenario, the other big one is geomagnetic disturbances. So in other words, charged particles thrown off from the sun it happens every once in a while. And then there's a big one in Canada about a couple of decades ago. But it, what happens under that scenario is that it turns all of your transmission lines into huge antennas. And you pick up a small DC voltage on your entire electrical system, and that's death to transformers. So if something like that happens, that's even worse because you're talking about destroying transformers across a huge geographical area all across the US. So that's another really bad one. So then there are people that work on that problem too. Um, maybe okay. So, so is, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll let you know. John, John Conley had a question. He, he raised his hand and then we can, we, we've got some questions in chat after I'll that. let you moderate it, Alan. You just tell me what to do. Okay, uh, John Conley, ask you a question. Right. Ted, this is John Conley. Hey, that was a nice talk. I got interrupted at the beginning for a few minutes. I missed this. Um, you may have mentioned this, but is there any significant interaction between the power stations? For example, if one is damaged or fails, does it increase the risk uh, or probability of failure in others nearby? And if so, does the modeling take that into account? Not, not directly, but if you have loss of generation in one area, that generation is picked up by other generators. And so you do open up, you do open yourself up to the possibility of a cascading failure. And, and that's exactly what was experienced in the large Northeast blackout 2004, uh, in which you had, you know, millions of people across the Northeast that were without electricity for many days. And what happened there was a, cla was a classic case of a cascading failure where there was a fault on one transmission line. Um, that itself wasn't a huge problem, but that caused power to be redirected in such a way that it overheated other transmission lines. And the transmission lines, when they overheat, they literally expand. That metal literally expands, which causes the, which causes the transmission lines to sag lower. And they sagged low enough that they faulted into more trees, which caused more transmission line faults, which caused more power to be directed through, redirected through fewer transmission lines, which exacerbated the problem. And pretty soon that just all spirals out of control and you have massive parts of the grid that are all switching off and that's a very large failure. So you can have that kind of a cascading failure, but otherwise there's not, there's not really any other direct uh, connection between them. If I'm if I'm interpreting your question correctly, yeah, that, that's actually was the, what I was directed towards. Is you know, will the increased load on the other ones increase the probability of failure? It, it it does decrease your margin a little bit. I mean, it is true. Your your hands are a little more tied. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so so John Brewster, you have an interesting question. You can just uh, ask it. Hey, uh, great talk. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Hey, uh, skilled workers as a limited resource, have you modeled that in? So we've talked about the equipment, the transportation, that sort of stuff, but are there enough people and, and how does that change the rate of repair? No, excellent question. Very complex to model. There are some people that are working on that. It's not included in our analysis just because of the extra complexity of it, but there are folks that do look at it. Um, the utilities all have ways there, there's a particular order of events uh, for utilities. So for example, in the Central Lincoln PUD, which is the utility that serves the Newport area, we have a good relationship with them. And uh, you know, they, have, they have a set of emergency supplies and all their trucks. Um, you know, in case of an earthquake happens or other disaster or emergency, and they have a certain um, uh, protocol by which if an if, uh, earthquake happens, you know, they're expected to first and foremost, make sure their family's okay, take care of any of that. 
but next, you know, there's a list of things that they're to take care of and they're to do. And so there, there is, there is some thought and modeling and knowledge about what the personnel can do or will be able to do, but it's, there's a lot of uncertainty and the really big uncertainty is what happens to just their ability to get around, right? There, we know that there will be a pretty large loss of the transportation system and that's difficult to model and anticipate, you know, you, it could be that you have equipment and trucks and people ready, but they can't get to where they need to get. And uh, that's very, very challenging to model. Yeah, I mean, just this last week, you know, I'm up here in Polk County. We had miles of roads uh, closed and all mixed, you know, trees all mixed in with power lines everywhere. We all had to go out as individuals with chainsaws to help them get access. Yeah. I and mean, it was, a, it's a mess. And that it was just, that's just local, no power station problems. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very challenging to model. We, we know it will be a problem, but it's very difficult to anticipate exactly what will happen. Thanks. Yeah. And we miss, missed a question from Fernando. Um, so I'll just read it uh, to, to move things along. So, so how did you model the different types of equipment fragility functions for the substation? Yeah, really, really good question. So uh, we have a, um, and actually we have a Vishvas Chalishazar on the call here, a former student of mine who's now at PNNL, who's an expert in this area as well. And um, we, he was working with Portland General Electric. And from that work, uh, we were able to get access to um, some modeling that was done by other uh, structural engineering experts um, that used a combination of modeling software and also some knowledge of other actual testing that's been done in the lab to determine these fragility functions for the individual components. So, so we do have access to data um, Fragility functions for circuit breakers, for transformers, for you know other types of equipment that we have in a substation, and of course they are estimates, and we know that. But um, but uh, there are people that do model that, and we do have some of that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and David Charlton has a pretty interesting question. I don't, this this could take the rest of the time or not. Um, so so without getting too political, you know, whatever. Uh, you want, however you want to interpret that. Uh, can, can you discuss the possible changes to the US grid as it relates to one, infrastructure proposals in Congress and two, the, the Green New Deal? Um, yeah, I think it might be, there might be more uncertainty around that than I can answer here. Um, I'll just mention that I, I think, you know, if there's kind of a takeaway from the Texas story, it's that it's good to be interconnected. You know, the more the more resources that you have, um, the more connection that you have to other resources. You know, the better that the better you are able to handle um, difficult situations. And so, you know, there have been a number of infrastructure proposals um, that have been bandied about for a while. Like a big one that never seems to get a ton of traction, but is a great idea, is to vastly expand the AC transmission system of the US and actually build a high voltage AC transmission system, higher voltage than we do right now, that connects areas that we currently don't have connected. And the idea is that the more that you do that, the more that you're able to take large amount of solar generation that's happening in this area or a large amount of wind generation that's happening in this area or this nuke plant in this area, right? Or these natural gas turbines in this area. And they're able to actually better share and the, be the more that you can share, um, the more that you, you know, have tools for handling either just the day-to-day -day variability or, um, you know, intermittent emergencies. And so, you know, I'm generally supportive of those infrastructure proposals. I think those are good. That could be part of a Green New Deal. I think, you know, Green New Deal, you're talking about the expansion of renewable energy even more so with even more with the government's blessing than we have now. And um, I think that that, it depends on how you implement it. You know, that can be um, if we're able to push more in the direction of energy storage and microgrid operation and that kind of thing, um, then that could be a great boon to resilience. However, if you, if you keep trying to shoehorn in um, these variable generation sources uh, like wind and solar into a system that's really designed to be very, very centralized like it is right now, then in some cases you can expose yourself to problems. Um, so I think it, it depends on the implementation. Yeah. Thanks. And Doug, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I, I had a question. Hey, Dr. Brecken, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Uh, not too bad. I had a question. So how far into the system did you model in terms of voltage? I'm just kind of wondering, did you get into the distribution system at all? I, I feel like the last like two weeks, even in here in, in Oregon, has been kind of eye-opening in terms of how long it's taken some of the utilities to get power back, just given the, uh, the ice storm we had. 
Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, did you primarily focus on the transmission side or like how, how far into the distribution system did we go? Um, I think the, the current model that we have, the one that was a great, great question, Doug. So first of all, great to hear from you. Doug's former patient, <laughs> so great to hear from you, Doug. Um, uh, this, this system that we're using here, which is an open access version of the WEC, mm -hmm. um, is, so I don't remember exactly, but it's down, we go down in the ballpark of 69K. Somewhere okay, down okay. I think that there's a few substations that are down to like the 13-ish. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and then Vishvash, you, you, Vishvash, you, you have a question? You want to just uh, go ahead and ask it? Sure. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, hi, Doctor Reckon. Uh, I was just uh, I was just wondering uh, if uh, if there are any uh, uh, plans to maybe you know do some sort of co-simulation of interdependent infrastructure, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, estimating the recovery of the system, um, or, or if, if at all, uh, you know, there are any best practices um, that, are, that are being used to estimate recovery times right now. No, it's an excellent question, obviously. And, you know, this, as you well know, I mean, so Vishwas is a person I mentioned earlier that, that worked with PGE. Uh, you know, as you well know, the complexity of the problem just like fractals exponentially as soon as you start including these other dimensions. So, um, you know, it's not something that we're doing, but it's an outstanding topic for future research. The only, the only thing I can say I'm aware of some people doing specifically things like that is um, there is, oh, and I'm so sorry for getting his name. Oh, shoot. Um, but anyway, there's a professor, I, I apologize so deeply that I forget their name, but there's a professor in civil engineering here that is working on um, agent modeling. So in other words, like, you know, modeling, you know, whether it's technicians or people or, or cars or whatever, as individual selfish agents and putting them in a certain situation, a certain environment, and then, you know, trying to get a sense of what the aggregate um, resultant behavior or collection of resources could be based on that, you know, so what kind of uh, complex behavior emerges from that. Um, and so there are some people that have the tools and have done a little bit of work on that, but Otherwise, it's we got our hands full with this part of it. I can't even think about that yet. And uh, and Brandon, you you got a question about Bill Gates' new book. You want to go ahead and ask that, or I mean, I can read it, um, or I can see it. He's just kind of asking about the yeah yeah, yeah. go go ahead I, I'm yeah. Not sure. So it's a good question, asking about the you know expansion of the system and um, you know those transmission towers got to go somewhere. Right, and they go on land. Um, yeah, it's not so on that one. I'll just have to punt. I, I don't have any expertise on the legal issues around that. Obviously, you know, most people are not um, super excited to have <laughs> electrical equipment on their property or near them. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those cl classic uh, "not in my backyard" kind of cases, um, and I, I can't blame them. I'm not super excited for that either. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's. I don't know. I, I don't have the expertise to comment on the issues around that, other than I know that it is it is an issue. Right. All right. I guess um, we've got uh, you know we've got got uh, I think to the end of the questions, but but I am curious uh, you know from from all of the studying and the analysis you've done uh, so far, you know what what are the uh, you know. What would you say the may you know if you could pick two things that we should be doing and and you know talking to our political leaders about doing and getting serious about you know what would they be if you had to prioritize? I guess I have a soft spot for the personal side of it. So um, there's a lot of things that each and every one of us can do to make sure that we are going to be an asset to our community if if a disaster does strike or when it does strike. Um, and so, you know, I'm not talking about doomsday prepping, I'm just talking about common sense things. And a lot of it is fairly, fairly simple to do. So for example, some of the things, very simple things you can do is just make sure that you have some kind of emergency plan. Um, and there's a lot of resources for this. The Benton County Sheriff's Office has a nice freely available document that talks about the kind of things that you can prepare for. Um, for example, you know, some of the easy things that we can do that we have in our, that I've done personally, 
um, is we have a store of two weeks worth of water for our family. It's about a gallon of water per person per day. And I just bought some, there's these nice stackable jugs. There's a variety of places you can get them online. And um, I keep um, enough, enough water for our family for two days, a gallon of person per day. Um, in our home, we also have, uh, that's the big one, water's the big one. Um, but then also, so there's, there's kind of things that some people don't think about. So a lot of people kind of think about food or guns or stuff like that. That's not the big one. What the big one is, is water. And the other one that a lot of people don't think about is sanitation. So the sewer system won't work. And what people will try to do is they'll try to use their toilet and they'll use the water that they have to try and flush their toilet. They'll dump buckets down it, which is doubly bad because you're wasting your water. But another is that that's not actually sufficient to properly flush out the sewer system. So the sewer system will back up and fail. And so um, handling the waste part of it properly is, is actually not a pleasant topic, but it's a big part of it. And it's really, really, really easy to do actually. There's what's called the two bucket method. If you read about that, it's just a, a method by which you can get buckets from Home Depot and you, there's some simple supplies and it allows you to have to establish a safe sanitary latrine system for your family so that you can shelter in place for you know maybe a week or two weeks or something like that. And of course, then you have water, or, I mean, sorry, you have food and things on top of that. But anyway, there's a number of those preparation guides. You can also get trained, you can get cert training so that you are, um, and you have some emergency response training and then you can be an asset to your community. Very, very simple things like that. Because the takeaway from a lot of this is that, um, is that you know, the, the help, help is not gonna swoop in right away. Um, everyone's going to have their hands full. And so the more that individuals are able to help each other and be supportive of each other and be able to shelter in place um, is, is really, I think, the, the, the biggest thing to helping a community um, get through it. And a lot of people have the impression that like people are going to rob each other and shoot each other. It's going to be chaos. That doesn't happen. Um, there's a number of, of research and books on that topic. It's, it's popular in movies, but it's not reality. And in fact, what happens in post-disaster situations is that people pull together and they help each other. And the more trained and prepared you are for that, the better that you can do that. Um, and then that's a really asset to community because you wanna be able to shelter in place and you wanna be able to, um, to help the people around you until you get to a point where you know, services are restored and things like that. So I think that that's my little spiel on the personal side of things. And if, you, if you're interested in that and some specific ideas around that, it's kind of a personal passion of mine. So please feel free to, to email me or follow up with me and I'm happy to share some of the tips, tricks or resources that are out there for that kind of thing. Well, yeah, thanks. That, that's useful to know. I, I had never really uh, thought about that latrine uh, oh. issue. So that, that's uh, eye-opening. And of course we have to stock up on toilet paper, right? We, that, that's a... Uh, that's the number one issue, right? Ingest. Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, this has been really interesting, uh, eye-opening, and uh, I think we're probably at the end of time today. But, uh, but as Ted said, he, he seems to be pretty open to further communication about this topic. And uh, in two weeks, we'll come back and, and we'll have another power systems uh, uh, topic um, from Eduardo, um, uh, Ted's colleague uh, here. And uh, that will be the end of the Tech Talks for this quarter and we'll start up again next quarter. So uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ted. That was a great talk. And we'll see everybody in two weeks. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone.